Anyway, that was that was my that was a message to me. But uh, sorry, Brittany. Uh, guys, you do it all the time. Amen. All right, this time we'll have our tithes and offerings. so much and we uh we thank you for this time of fellowship we thank you for uh gathering us here lord and we know that it's uh not by accident lord that you uh you, you put us here uh, tonight for a reason lord and then there's going to be a moment where uh we get to choose you in, in every every situation and uh we just pray that your blessings be on this offering lord, we pray for every uh person who's uh Given to you tonight, Lord. We just pray that uh, they would be blessed by their giving. And, uh, Lord, we don't know what tomorrow holds, but Lord, we know that you hold it. And we're comforted in that. We just pray your blessings on everyone here. And, uh, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Standing, turn around and wave to the people that came in late. <laughs> okay, you can be seated. See, well, what you didn't know is you, there are people back there. They came in and sat down, and there's people back there. Is it good to be in God's house tonight? I tell you, as we sang those songs, I was just so impressed about testimony. Testimony. When we were singing about how that His blood had ransomed us, and we sang about power in the blood, and we talked about how... Well, that song that you played, Donito, just how I'm free in Jesus. No rapture can tell. I just cannot be silent. His love doth continually dwell. Redeemed. We, we have a story. It's a good story. And I just praise Him for that tonight. I want to tag, it's, it's seldom that, that, that the, the weaving that I do on Sunday morning and Sunday night dovetails so beautifully together. But in talking about our circles of prayer, and in, in, in talking about how to pray, the importance of prayer and the value of prayer, 
I, I, I just found that it just tagged so tightly in with what we were doing this morning. This morning, as, as I preached from Isaiah uh, chapter 43, you know, it's talking about the Babylon captivity and how that God was so active in that, you know, 25 times the, He says, I will and I have and I'm going to and I will speak over you and I will sing over you and all of these things that He's going to do. It's so awesome. And it was to a people that's in captivity. Tonight's passage is a little bit different, but it is on the same line. I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm chapter 126. Psalm 126. And tonight we are looking at a post-exilic. That's a big $10 word, which means after they came back from captivity in Babylon. It's a post-exilic psalm that is beautiful. It tells about what God has done and how wonderful it is to be His child. It, Psalm 126 is a testimony in its own right. And it just shows the value of believing that God can and will answer prayer. Let's look at Psalm 126 tonight. When the Lord brought back the captives of, to Zion, we were like men who dreamed... Our mouths were filled with laughter and our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. And we are filled with joy. Verse 4. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. He who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. Junior, will you pray for the reading of God's Word tonight, please? Heavenly Father, how thankful we are for this beautiful day today. Thank you, Lord, for the beautiful service this morning and for all your goodness to us. Yes. We're thankful for this good crowd is here tonight, Lord. We pray that you bless each one and bless our fellowship together and bless the, the reading of your word, the preaching of your word, and your anointing to be a full fashion day, Lord. We pray. And just lead us and guide us and make us a blessing. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I am so happy to be here tonight. It will soon be five years, but it's been four and about a half since I was minding my own business in Kansas or in Kentucky. I'll get the right state. <laughs> and a group of people about March got together and had 30 days of prayer and fasting. And we're fasting for a man that they did not know. And we're praying for a leader that they had not met. I want to tell you my testimony tonight. God hears the prayer. Amen. The intentional, desperate, passionate prayer of His people. Now I want you to know that uh, it, it, it wasn't the kind of thing that I was looking at. I have a tendency to, to be planted and to try to bloom where I'm planted. I, when I go to work, I, I don't, I'm not looking at the next horizon. This is not an occupation for me. This is a ministry. And I told God at the very beginning of my ministry, I said, if you ever want me, come get me. I don't want to have to sell myself. You come get me. Well, they came and he got me. And he gave me three interviews to do. And I hate doing three interviews in a row. But I had a I had a 50th year anniversary to do in San Antonio, Texas of my in-laws. And so on the way through, we did one in, in uh, Glenwood, Arkansas. We went and we had the 50th year anniversary. As soon as we were through with that, we, we ran down to the coast and celebrated our 25th. And, then we came back up through Dallas, Texas and interviewed at Dallas First Church. And then we came over here. Glenwood was a shut door. Dallas First Church was a shut door. Amen. 
Well, and as soon as we finished here, I said, come on, Susan, let's go home. Let's go back to work. But when I got back to Kentucky, my heart was stirred. There was something about your vision and something about the calling of the Lord on my life that I just, I just wanted to come figure out what that was. What a joy it is to be a part of this with you. And I, and I want you to know, I'm still trying to figure this out, and I love Surrender 2020 that we're about to do. If you're new to the church and you're visiting tonight, we have a prayer agenda that we do every year. And we, we pray and fast, and if you can't skip food, if that's an issue in your life, then you can sacrifice something. But for a whole month, we pray and seek the face of God for intentionally, for spiritual things, for His people, for His church, for our lives. It's not, I want a Ferrari, so I'm going to pray until I get it. It's not a, It's not an activity of greed, but it's, we want Your will, Lord. We want Your, we desire Your presence in our life. And I want you to know that God has significantly answered prayers over the years and He has been good to us. We prayed for and built a new parsonage. We prayed for and saw the man who's just sitting down right now, a new liver. And it was all because of the intentional, powerful prayer of the people of God who would draw a circle around a particular thing and pray until God answers. One of the things we prayed for was new land. Alice, I want you to know that the board was talking the other day and we are about to make some moves on that new land. We're excited about what he will do. And the first thing is, now that we've begun to clean it and now we're going to open it up and see what he wants to do. Isn't it exciting what God does through prayer? Did you know that God does nothing except through prayer? And did you know that we don't even know what to pray for till we know His heart? We pray to Him as a communication with Him until we discover the passion that He lays on our heart or the need that life develops in our midst. And then we pray about that thing until God answers our prayer. I am naive enough to believe that there is a God in heaven. And I'm not Him. And that He's worth getting to know. And that when I get to know Him, He will move me to achieve things and to dream things in this day and age. When the Lord brought back the captives to Zion, we were like men who dream. Do you still dream? Do you just believe this world's going to hell in a handbasket? Or that God can still stop the erosion of our culture and the spiritual nature of our churches and can give life back to His people again? When we look at this psalm, the one thing that we see about it that's different from others is the little caption that's under it. Do you see that? But it says it's a song of ascent. Does that mean anything to you? It's real cool. We only have limited songs of ascent. Some of the guys, they're not right, but they believe that it was songs that were used in worship as the priests were climbing the ladders and doing things in, in the temple. That's not right. It's much better than that. The ascent songs... Psalms are songs that the people of God would sing as they ascend unto the hill of Jerusalem, the mount of God, and worship in the temple. Let me see if, it, if you can understand what I'm saying. Psalm 20 to Psalm 32 is the limited hymn book of the ascent psalms, and they were sung as worshipers 
from all over the area of Judea, Galilee, and places far away, Rome, Antioch, whenever they would come to Jerusalem to worship at a feast or a festival, they were going to church and they couldn't hardly wait. And they would sing these songs. And they all knew in my heart, kind of like there's power in the blood. Kind of like love lifted in me. Kind of like amazing grace. And I'm going to hit on that little point that I made today. Not that it's fair, but I'm going to do it anyway because I think it's right. If you don't come to church because you don't get anything out of it, I don't either. I don't come to get something out of church. I come to put something into the worship of God. I come to testify of His name. I come to encourage the believer. I come to, I've come read up, prayed up, I'm ready. We come to worship God. Why all of a sudden have we become consumers in worship? But these people, when they came to worship, they were prayed up. And they would sing these songs collectively as they ascended to the, to the temple of God. But what is interesting is this is not a psalm of old. This is not a psalm of David. This is a psalm that was created after the return from Babylon. This was a psalm that was created after the people were delivered. Not from Egypt, but from Babylon. They couldn't believe it. And somebody wrote it. And so the people of God, ever since that time, will sing this song as they ascend into the temple to worship God in the Jewish culture. Be a pretty good song for us to sing. Be a pretty good song for us to read. Because only and they had not forgotten what God had done. When the Lord brought back the captives to Zion, we were like men who dream. I have a question. How in the world do you keep a dream for 70 years? When you are a people in captivity and your safety has been taken away and the life you know it has been jerked away and you've been hauled hundreds of miles up and around the desert down to Euphrates and into Babylon, how in the world do you believe 70 years is a lifetime? Would you hang on for 70 years to someone's proposal for marriage? Could you hang on for 70 years in the promise of a sweet clearinghouse, sweet steak? Oh, you won! But we can't give it to you until 70 years from now. Can you hang on to a promise how in the world do you keep a dream continuous for 70 years? Because 70 years was the amount of time that the people were in Babylon. I'll tell you how you do it. You dream big and you keep circling the wagons. You dream big and you keep praying the prayer. If God has given you a promise, if He has communicated a plan, you pray it into existence no matter how long it takes. Because God is a God who still answers the intentional prayers of His people. Only God can keep the passion burning for His plan, for your life, and for His supernatural activity to happen through prayer. Only He can do it. We make it sound like prayer is something we do. Prayer is something that happens in a relationship with God. And if we're praying the right things and dreaming the right things and believing the right things, He will continue to give the hope for those things. 
verse 2, Our mouths were filled with laughter and our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, The Lord has done great things to them. Notice that it didn't become a testimony of the nations until it was on the tongues and in the laughter of the people. Woo! We have been given land! Woo! We've been given the healing through Andy! Woo! The prayer of the church has produced the pastor! It's our testimony. We started with nothing, but we dreamed a new house for our pastor, and we raised ninety thousand dollars, and we started to build it, and we took out a little bit of money, and we built it in sixteen, and now it's twenty, and we only lack about eighteen thousand dollars to pay it off. God answers prayer. This is not what we have done. This is what He has done and is doing. But it became a testimony of the nations. Wow, look what He's done for the people of God. Why? Because it was on their lips. It was in the demeanor of which they worshiped and how they praised the Lord. Verse 3, The Lord has done great things for us and we are filled with joy. I like the fact that an answered prayer just produces more communication with God. So we're getting this wonder and this joy and this testimony to God. But look in verse 4. Verse 4 through 6 is a prayer. Restore our fortune to the Lord like the streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. He who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. As we began, in just a few short weeks, our prayer and fasting or sacrifice, which we call our Surrender 2020, which is our time of prayer and fasting or prayer and surrender, we are understanding that intentional intercessory prayer where you Put a circle around the agendas that God has given you or given us and you get in it and pray it until the answer comes. We understand that it is hard work. We understand that it's not a tiptoe through the tulips. It is intentional. It is decisive. It is passionate. It takes energy. It takes, it, it takes emotion. Because any good relationship does. But we still elicit people to do that because those who carry the seed to sow will return with songs of joy. Woohoo! We got land and didn't pay a dime for it. Woohoo! We have a new parsonage and God has given us the resources. Woohoo! Andy is preaching and leading a church and leading people to Jesus. I want to get married in March because God has delivered His help. Amen. And I believe it is because it's through the prayer of the people of God. So as we enter this season, my encouragement is that we, we dream God's dream. We dream big. Not just that However big we can dream, we can get it because we can name it and claim it. I'm not a name it, claim it guy. I'm a know it and pray it guy. Listen to the promise of God. Know the promise of God. Know the heart of God and the will of God. And pray big. Pray continuously. Pray consistently. Pray passionately. God will answer the prayers of His people. Circle makers have a sanctified stubborn streak. To be a good prayer warrior, you know what God has said. You will not leave your needs or the agenda for which you pray until it is answered. Can you really pray for something for 70 years? Look at Psalm 126. Somebody did. 
God answered. And the people for generations till then when it was written, until He comes again, will praise God for the way He delivered the people from slavery. <laughs> Circle makers have a sanctified, stubborn streak. They are tenacious because their vision is prompted by God. And because His will must be done in their life space, they will not take no for an answer. They know that God is good and they will hang on to the altar until it is answered. Prayers that, that we pray must not be from a selfish motive. But it must be for the advancement of the kingdom and to glorify God's name. Look at verse 2. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. We are not about promoting our agenda, but about promoting His agenda. And when, when we pray His kingdom into existence, then it's awesome what is done and how God gives the glory. How would you like to have been a disciple? It's one thing to know about God. It's another thing to know God. Aren't there people that you'd like to hear pray? Man, they don't know. They don't just know the jargon. And it's not just a habit. I mean, they know. They have a hotline. And, and I don't mean to be all culture, but I'll tell you, there are some black preachers that know how to pray. They know how to reach up and hug His neck as they bring His presence into a place. And I'm telling you, we need those kind of prayers. Not just if I can dream it, I can say it, and I can accomplish it, and I can make it happen. It has nothing to do with you. It has to do with the God who knows you. There's no shortcut to establishing a worthy prayer agenda. It must be established through anointed time in His presence. Oh God, what do you want? Hi God, how are you today? Oh me, I'm fine. What do you want to get done today? The disciples had heard Jesus pray. They knew that He knew the Father. And they said, oh Jesus, teach us to pray like You. Teach us to pray. Teach us how to know God on such a personal level. And He said, pray like this. Pray with me, would you? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be that your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven stop that is exactly how we are to develop our agenda is to spend enough time with him that we know his heart and know his agenda and yes we're still putting together our agenda or Surrender 2020. You can call the office. You can talk to Marcia. You can talk to me. You can talk to Mary Ann. We're putting the agenda together. Because we still believe that God puts in the heart of His people the agendas for which they dance around until the answer is given. Most of us don't get what we want because we do not know what we want. Now think about that a little bit. Most of us don't get what we want because we don't know what we want. How cool it is that when the only thing that we want is Jesus, we can get exactly what we want. And isn't it cool that when we really get Jesus, that then the only thing that we want is what He wants. Boom. Now we have our prayer agenda. And it's exciting that it is so relational and so easy. We also fell in prayer for another reason. Because we put circling the passionate requests until they're answered. We pray, but we don't persist. We pray, but we don't agonize. 
We don't get down nitty gritty until the victory is won. We have a tendency in our human nature to just give up too easily. Jesus said that we're not heard because of our multiplicity of words or our long prayers, but by the passion and the intention of our heart toward the need that is real in the lives, our lives and the lives of His children around us. He said, you're not heard because you're many words. I know what you need. Just ask. Yet there are times when rather than run into His presence and run out, we need to like hold on the altar until God comes and God answers our longing prayer. Praying through is all about intensity. It's qualitative, not quantitative. And I want our Surrender 2020 to be quality. I, I would love for you to come in and go, hey, somebody say, hey, why are you smiling? Oh, God is so good. Well, is He answering for in your life? No. Well, we've just been hanging out. It's been so wonderful. I would love for our, our prayer agenda 2020. And, and I am not asking you to pray. I'm telling you to pray. I'm not asking for you to please participate. I'm telling you to participate. We want 100% participation. Because if your prayer life is not passionate, you're probably not His child. And it's good to exercise this and to be able, well, I'm just not about fasting. Did you notice I said prayer, fasting, and or sacrifice? Everybody can get closer to God. Praying through is knowing God's heart and not taking no for an answer. <coughs> Praying through is not always pretty. It's messy. Usually it involves tears and often groaning. Praying through doesn't just bend His ear. It touches His heart. I want to tell you something that I sure hope doesn't come back to bite me. But in my lowest times, when my heart was the heaviest, oh, it was ugly. My prayer life wasn't real great at the very beginning of my loss. And I would just utter these two words. Oh God. And those aren't cuss words when you're talking to it, by the way. It's almost like His presence. I mean, this is pretending He's far away and He's not. He'd lean over heaven and go, Yes? It's almost like there was just a gentle heaviness. Just, just, just a little pressure in the room. Bam. Like that. Guys, I'm telling you, in those early days, it was almost like when I would evoke His presence, there was an unfolding of a blanket in the room. And it went wall to wall and ceiling to floor. There wasn't a lot of conversation, but His presence was near. And praying through is when we pray to the end of our heart to the end of our emotion, to the last ounce of energy of strength that we have, praying through, does it bend His ear, it touches His heart, and He comes and He blesses His kids. And the answer may not come immediately, but this I know it will come. When the people were preparing to march around Jericho, God gave Joshua, the instructions of how it was to be done. The people had already crossed the Jordan and they're camping not on the east side of the Jordan, but now they're on the west side of the Jordan. And the people of Jericho were biting their fingernails. And the city was walled up. No one came out. No one went in. And God looked at Joshua and said, Look, the city has already been given to you. Woo! <laughs> 
<laughs> it's not time to pray for the walls to come down. It's time to thank Him that they're coming down. Praise Him instead of asking. <laughs> See, what I love about it is sometimes it takes a little time for the prayer to be answered, but you know it's going to happen. Why? Because He's given you the assurance in your heart. Prayer is such a wonderful thing. Is it possible to keep a dream alive for 70 years? Psalm 126 suggests that it's so. It's interesting that the people, through though incarcerated for 70 years, continue to believe and intercede that they would return home and that worship could return to a demolished temple. They had no temple. They had no homes. They had no infrastructure. They had a hill that had rubble on it. And that's all. The vineyards had been plucked up. Everything had been stolen. They had nothing. And yet they prayed for 70 years. 70 years. That God would keep His promise and restore to them their land and their temple and their worship and their place of hope. Well, Pastor, how do you know that? I'm glad you asked. We know it because Daniel, an exile in Babylon, would open his window toward Jerusalem and pray. Let's see if y'all help. How many times a day? You read this story too. There were people praying for the restoration of Jerusalem. God hears the prayers of His people. And yes, He can help you dream a dream that is so big, it takes 70 years to get it done. Please understand, it is supernatural that a person keeps circling the same prayer agenda for such a long time. Would you be one of those? Could you pray for the restoration the relationship? For the conversion of the child? For the reintroduction of the spiritual vitality in a dying nation? Could you be the one? I believe that the reason that God tarries is because He just likes to love people. He likes it that His church and His people believe Him and, and reinvest in Him and give Him a chance to do something in their lives. In his book, The Circle Maker, Mark Batterson states, neuroimaging are taking pictures of the brain has shown this, that as we age, the center of cognitive gravity tends to shift from the imaginative, I'm, I'm trying to see where you guys are, right brain, to this logical left brain as you get old. And you're basically saying, huh? This is what that means. This neurological tendency presents a spiritual danger. At some point, we quit living out of imagination. God is real. God still speaks to His people. God answers prayer. If He puts it in your heart, He's going to do it if you're faithful and pray it into existence. You shift from that imaginative and start living out of memory. When people begin to slip into dementia, they quit operating with the nap and can only operate out of 
the way it was. So now the proof that neuroimaging has shown that as we age, the center of cognitive gravity shifts from an imaginative right brain to logical left brain. So if you're getting older like me today, it would do good that you would intentionally, determinedly, <clears throat> passionately seek the face of an unseen God and know Him in His nature and serve Him in His will for your life. Instead of living by faith, we live by logic these days, which is a bad sign. Our spiritual vehicle has a bigger windshield than a rear view mirror. Now Norman Moore used that illustration to talk about letting go of the pain of the past and look to the future of God's presence. But I use it tonight to say God has more to do ahead of us than He has to do behind us. Let's glance at that rear view mirror and see that Psalm 126, He delivered His people from slavery and He'll deliver you too. He gave them the... He, he plundered Egypt when they left Egypt and gave them a promised land. God has more for us than anything in this world that is against us. And we need to know His promises and draw a circle around that promise. Get in it and stand in it until He answers our prayer. Amen? With your heads bowed and your eyes closed tonight, go on looking around, no music play. Right here. Right now. You can look into your heart of hearts and know. Are you operating your spiritual life from a cognitive level? operating from a spiritual level? Have you believed that God is real? You believe that God is real and that He raised His Son from the dead and He can raise you from your deadness? Or you're just going by cognitive fact? If it's in a textbook, if it's in a science essay, you believe it, otherwise you don't believe it. I'm telling you, God is real. Give Him a chance. Scripture we read here a while back was, test and see that the Lord is good. Ask me for a sign, God says. I'll show you. Draw a circle. Put a fleece in it if you have to. I'll, I'll get in it with you. There is no need for you to end your life Merely in the memories of the past, you can end your life with a powerful passion of a moving, powerful God. Father, tonight, I pray that you will charge our batteries. Help us to believe that you can do the impossible. We are intentional. We are decidedly giving ourselves to you. Show us the prayer agenda so that we can see you accomplish amazing things in our lives and in our culture. I pray that tonight, anyone who rests your existence will know that you are real before they leave this building. And I pray for those that struggle find the peace and the confidence and the promise in your presence that you will make all things new. Make it 2 Corinthians 5.16 true in their lives tonight, I pray. We love you and we want your presence to be real as we have experienced you here in this worship and as we experience you and each other in fellowship. Bless us as we leave this place. Bless this food to the good of our bodies. And bless us as we continue to proclaim you as Lord and Savior. 
In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. I think you're